Remember what you brought me from this morning. Just like it's been raining for months, God, today you let the sun shine. And God, it reminded me of how you brought me out of the darkness into your marvelous light. And God, I pray we as a people, as a church, God, that we will continue to press into that marvelous light. God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you. God, I thank you for my brother. I pray you would anoint him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet this morning. God, I pray right now he would be a cleaned out vessel, God, that you would speak through to 400 people in this place. May you divide your word so it hits every one of our hearts and speak individually to each and every one of us. And for that, God, we're going to thank you because only a God like you could do that. You know what we're in need of. So speak through your man and we're going to thank you in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Well, we're supposed to have a baptism service first, but I'm ready to preach. So, and, uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're going to do a little bit of preaching. Take your Bibles with me this morning, and I want to go ahead and get you where we're going. Uh, Acts chapter 9, if you would. Acts chapter 9. It's where we're going to be at this morning. New Testament, three quarters of the way through your Bible. Fifth book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The book of Acts. It's a book of action all the way through. It's a beautiful book. It shows the birth of the, the church and so much more. This morning you're about to see four folks walk through the baptismal pool. Not to be saved, but because they're already saved. They've already given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're following Him in obedience to what Christ has commanded us. You're going to see a video for each one. And I want you to pay attention because... They're talking about their story and what their life used to be like and what their life is like now. Because I want to tell you, anybody that's ever been saved, you have a story to tell. Amen? You know what you were like. You know when Christ came into your life and you know what your life like now. And if you don't have that, then something's wrong. I mean, it truly is. I was coming this morning from the passage of Scripture that God's grace is sufficient for every hour in our life. But God won't let me move away from a salvation message again this morning. And so this is for someone that's here. I believe that. And I'm thankful that God chases, chases us down. Amen? Amen? After they finish their baptism, we're going to look at a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus and how he became Paul the Christian. And we're going to look at his testimony after we watch their testimony. So first of all, Miss Marissa Metcalf is going to be coming down. And praise God, the water's warm this morning. Amen? <laughs> so, Brother Greg. My name is Marissa Metzkaff, and this is my story. As a child, I didn't really have a good childhood growing up. I was mostly in, in and out of houses, but until the age of 11, I lived with my aunt up until high school. So as I'm in middle school, she introduced me to church. She actually forced me to go to church because I never really liked church. I didn't have like the best friends. In the entire world, I used to have like people that used to tell me to do this and do that, so I listened to a lot of people. So in high school, I had this dream where I was sitting in a cafe by myself until Jesus actually sat down with me and told me that I need to have a relationship with him and that he would like to see me get baptized. And I was like, oh, okay, so I need to have this deep relationship. So when I woke up from the dream, I saw automatically started having these feelings. Like I read the Bible and I was like, oh, there's more to it than the story that I've been told. I started to bond with him more and more as I kept reading. The reason why I knew I got saved is because I felt like this hole in my heart, I felt like a hole in my heart in my whole entire life. Until one day I woke up and it was gone, like this weight had been lifted. And I finally knew that I was saved by him and that nothing could touch me or harm me or anything. So I realized that I was a child of his. And that's what I knew. I would like to thank my friends, my aunt, because without my aunt, I wouldn't be here. And without my friends, I wouldn't know Christ because they're all... Jesus lovers. And so I'd like to thank all of you for helping along with my journey. Amen. If you're a friend of Marissa and you're here, uh, not the church family, she's got friends here. If you're, everybody's a friend, but real friends. If you're a friend of Marissa, would you please stand? Look at here. They've been by you all this time, haven't they? 
and they're going to walk with you between now and the time that all of you go to see Jesus. Now, you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Yes. If you're a church family and you want to support her in her baptism, would you please stand? Face this way. Because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Church, I want to introduce you to Riley. Let's hear her story. Hi, my name is Riley Evans, and this is my testimony. And my life before Christ was very bad. I was making bad decisions, and I was hanging out with the wrong friends and like the wrong group of people in school. I was not doing good and like I was going off doing bad things and that I shouldn't have been doing and I would not obey my parents before Christ either. When I met Christ, all that changed. I was in a trip on with the church to Pigeon Forge and like the third session that we was in. My stepmom asked me if I wanted to get saved, and I was like, yeah. I realized that I needed Christ because, like, it didn't feel right without Him in my life. The difference in my life is that now I'm making good decisions, doing what I should be doing, making good grades, hanging out with the right people that I should be and the right friends, and obeying my parents, and most of the time doing the right thing for, like, when my parents tell me to. I would like to thank my stepmom, my dad, my grandma, well, actually all my grandmas, and my mom for leading me the right way to Christ. Amen. Amen. Church family, this is Riley Evans, and uh, if you're in her immediate family, would you please stand? Let's go up here. Look at here. Amen. Church family, if you support her in her baptism today, would you please stand? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Church family, I want to introduce you to Abby, but we will call her by her full name, Abigail. <laughs> this is going to be fun, I promise you. Just look at that way. There you go. My name is Abigail Green, and this is my story. I was... A kid who thought of nothing but myself, okay? I lied to everyone around me, felt trapped and hurt inside. I kind of changed when my great-great-aunt died. I started thinking about people around me. So I went to church with my um, grandma. The pastor was asking if... Um, anyone wanted to get saved I went up there with her and um prayed the prayer it took me a few days for me to adjust to everything um that had happened but I changed I changed a lot I feel much better 
I feel like I'm clean and not hurt or trapped inside of me. Started to pray for people around me. And I uh, try to help out people as much as I can. I would like to thank my grandmother, my mom, my dad, Ms. Patsy, Greg, and Brother Marty. You come over here. I want you to see her face when she comes up. Folks, I've invited Abby's dad, Brandon, to come in the pool with us for her baptism. If I get them both at the same time, I'd try that, but I don't Somebody have to baptize herself, so... Uh, Abby, you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is Brandon. And this will get better. Here we go. My name is Brandon Green, and this is my story. Before I met Christ, there was no peace, no joy. I cussed every other word. I struggled with depression. I was not the father my kids needed, and I was not the father my wife deserved. And I just, I just didn't know how to get out of the struggle I was in. The Sunday before the Super Bowl, I had asked God to forgive me, and I left church feeling worse than I did when I went in. I felt like I had missed my chance because I had been feeling it. I'd been feeling the pull, but I just, I wasn't, I wasn't willing. The next Wednesday, I end up going to church. First Wednesday I'd ever went. The next Sunday was Super Bowl Sunday. I had already told my wife that I wasn't coming Sunday night because I wanted to watch the Super Bowl, but God had other plans. Sunday morning, there was five baptisms. And during the first baptism, when they asked for the church family to stand up or however it goes, I'm not even for sure. I was, I was in a different world. My daughter stood up and she saw that I didn't. And she asked me, why are you not standing up? And I said, I'm not a part of this church. And that, that really hurt me. By the time the last baptism come around and her testimony and what she had to sacrifice to have a relationship with Christ, I thought, all I have to do is give up my sins. I don't have to lose my family. I mean, why am I making such a big deal out of this? We get out of church Sunday and, you know, I'm, I, I still don't feel different. Well, my wife's like, you going Sunday night? And I'm like, well, you know what? I'll check it out. So I ended up going Sunday night, going to a life group for the first time, and we had a blast. It was great. When you're born again, the, the whole view changes. Things that used to matter don't. Things that used to not matter do. Well, Monday morning, I woke up and I couldn't control myself. I was driving to work, crying and praying. I was like, what is going on with me? Who is this guy? Tuesday rolls around, same thing. I'm crying and praying. I'm like, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I mean, this is just crazy. I'm telling my wife's asking me what, you know, you know, is it, did you, did you give in finally? And I'm like, I don't know. I, you know, I'm still denying it. By the time Wednesday rolled around, I was on fire and I had to talk to Marty. I was like, I've got to do something about this. And after I talked to Marty, it was like, Shazam, it's over. I mean, I'm, I'm there. And ever since then, I have, I have been on fire 
and I love it. I, I, I can't get enough of it. I, I mean, I've, I've, since I've become a Christian, I've already seen the power of prayer. I've seen prayers come to fruition. I've seen relationships start to mend. It's absolutely amazing. And the love that I feel, I've never felt before. And I thank God for my salvation every day. And that's my story. I know you have family here to support you, and that, that family was here also to support Abby, but I got too excited. So uh, if you're in the family with Brandon, if you would please stand, look here. Yes. They're just praising Jesus. We just stop here and have a spell. <laughs> but uh, we better not. So... Uh, Church, if you're here to support Brandon and his baptism, would you please stand? Brandon, you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. There ain't no doubt. <laughs> because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the Amen. Brandon asked me, he said, what do I do when I come out of the water? And I said, I don't, I don't understand. And he said, what can I do when I come out of the water? I said, now I understand. I said, brother, if you are led by the Spirit, you do whatever the Spirit of God leads you to do. And... Um, so he, it's just been exciting to walk this path with, with, uh, with all these folks. And Brandon, and I, I tell you, church, God's up to some good things around here. Amen? Amen. Many people, many people coming to Christ. And, and by the way, we have three more uh, in the wings that we're getting ready to baptize. So God is working. He's working. Uh, but I've got a question for you. And, and the question is this. Um, do you have a story? Do, do you have a story? Do you have a story? Because every person that's ever been born again has a story. And it's not one you have to make up. It's your story. It's all about you. It's you. This morning, I, I want to look at, at this subject, the confrontation with grace, because that's what happens when, when we truly get saved. Grace hits us like a, like a truck, and we have this confrontation with what we're going to do there. Saul of Tarsus later became Paul the Apostle. Ended up pinning most of what we call the, the New Testament, all the epistles. The epistles to the church, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, all of those were, were pinned by God through him to be a great encouragement to the church. You've heard their story. I want to look at Saul's story this morning. And from there, let's just ask ourselves, do we know what our story is? Now, let me give you a little bit of background about him before I truly get into his background but uh, this man, Saul of Tarsus, is uh, getting ready to set out on a journey. He's headed to a city by the name of Damascus, leaving Jerusalem. I want you to know that he is everything what we would call 100% a terrorist at this point in his life. This is who he is. He is a terrorist. By every definition that we have for the word terrorist, this is who he is. He's a religious, religious terrorist. Terrorist. He has secured letters from the high priest to go to Damascus, to go to the synagogue, and to arrest and to kill Christians that he finds there. He is wanting to eliminate every single Christian that he could find. He is setting out on the road to Damascus hunting Christians. He is hunting Christians. What he didn't know was Jesus Christ was hunting him at the same time. Amen? Amen. Man, yesterday I'm at my house and it's pouring down rain. I'm like, what is that noise? And so I walk out and, and went up in the woods a little bit and somebody let all their beagles out. I mean, I don't know how many beagles got out, 
But they were running through the woods, and I mean, nothing was going to detour them. They got on the, uh, the smell of something, and they came through my property. They ran on both sides of me, didn't pay any attention to me, and just kept right on going. And I thought, Lord, how mercy. There were seven, eight of these things. They, they, they got on the smell of something, and they weren't going to stop. Well, let me tell you something. The hound dog of heaven, and I hope you don't mind me saying it that way, is after Saul right here. He's after him. You know, I'm so thankful that he was after me one day. I'm so thankful for that, folks. I'm so thankful he was after me. Jesus Christ is hunting him, and on a road outside of Damascus, Saul ran into the very Jesus that he was persecuting, and by the time their little confrontation, their meeting was over, Saul the terrorist became Paul the Christian. And almost everywhere he went, he gave us his story. You see it multiple times throughout Acts. In front of those that were in high positions, in front of the great thinkers of the day, in front of the common everyday folks, this is the story that he would tell. If you're feeling the back of your bulletin, he always began with and his former life. And what his life was like before Christ. And you've heard them talk about this, the, the hole that was there and the way that they did things and, and no joy and depression. Uh, they've all gave you a little bit of story of, of their life, their former life, and there's so much more to it. But you're in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this. It says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. You see that word murder there? This is who this guy is right now, folks. He's a murderer of Christians. Of Christians. Murder is bad in any sense. He went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. If you know anything about Saul, you know that he was on the Sanhedrin. He was what he called a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament like none other person, probably. He was, a, he was very zealous. Someone said he was the most zealous of the Jews. And to him, he saw Christianity as a threat to Judaism. And he knew that Christianity needed to be stamped out. This man, Jesus, we don't know if he ever met him. If he did, he never says anything. But this man, Jesus, was a, was a Jew that died on a cross. And anybody that's hung on a cross was a curse. So this is a cult and nothing but a cult, and we need to get rid of these Christians. So he's on his way to find those that are following the way. That simply means the way of life that's found in Jesus Christ. If you went back two chapters, he's standing there as one of the very first deacons. A man by the name of Stephen is being stoned for his faith. The Bible says that he actually gave consent. He gave permission for them to kill Stephen at this point. You jump into chapter 8, and the Bible says Saul now breathing out more threats. And the church went into a time of persecution unlike anything else with this Saul of Tarsus there. I read where someone said at the stoning of Stephen that he had smelled the blood of persecuted Christians, and it was an aroma he liked. He was thirsty for their blood, and he went to the high priest, and he said, Give me extradition papers. Let me go to Damascus. Let me hunt them down. I even want to go outside of the city and do this. And specifically, he wanted to go to Damascus. Now, that's important for us to understand because this is a city that was 150 miles north of Jerusalem. Now, folks, they couldn't call an Uber. They didn't have cars. This was either by camel, horseback, or they were going to walk. But the point that the Bible is making it wants us to see how far this man was willing to travel in order to find Christians that he could assault and that he could arrest. This man is a, is a violent foe of Jesus Christ and a violent foe of anybody that claimed to be a follower of Christ. Now the Bible through the Holy Spirit wants you and I to see that. It wants us to recognize that. The Bible wants us to see how utterly opposed to Jesus this man was. Why? So you can understand the love of Jesus Christ for every human being. So that you can see the grace of God that's poured out for every single human being. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's no addendums to that. There's no sinner that's outside the grace of Almighty God. Not even one that was like this. And this man was awful. 
There's a place in the Bible, and I believe the Bible is, is all given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he actually makes this statement that he is the chief of sinners. Maybe he was, folks. Maybe he was. But this chief of sinners, this foe of Jesus Christ, this persecutor of the church, is about to meet his match on the road to Damascus. He's about to run into the living Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible wants us to see that if anybody could become a, a devoted follower of Christ, anyone like this guy, then there is not a person under the sound of my voice that is beyond the reach of God's grace here this morning. Amen, church? No one. I mean, here's the thing. Is there anyone in here that God can't forgive? Not a single person. Is there any sin that you've committed that God can't forgive? Not a one. Is there anybody that God can't save? No one. Whosoever will may call upon the name of the Lord and shall be saved, the Bible says. Whosoever will. Now watch what happens in verse 3. We're still in his former life. And as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice. Well, understand where he is now. He's probably on horseback. He's traveling to Damascus. He's after the slaughter of believers. And the Bible says that all of a sudden he was knocked down by the light from the Lord. Isn't it amazing that it was in the midst of some of the most terrible evil against the church of Jesus Christ that that's where Christ found him? Right in the middle of his sin. Is where Jesus Christ found him. The Bible says that the light appeared suddenly, out of nowhere, and unexpectedly. The Bible says that the light was from heaven. In one part it says that the, the light outshined the, the noonday sun. That's how bright the light was. And the light was from heaven. The light's going to speak in a moment when we know the light to be the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how bright the glory of God is. That's how powerful the grace of God is. And he's knocked to the ground. He's not to the ground. I believe before anybody can truly ever get saved, they have to have the light of the gospel penetrate their heart. There has to be that time when it hits us that we're lost. I grew up in church all my life. Most of you have heard my testimony. I'm not going into it in detail. But I grew up in church all my life. I was a good kid. I was a good kid. I never did anything that was wrong. I disobeyed my parents, but I never got into the things that other people were getting into. I was a good kid. I was teaching children's church and junior's church. But I was lost. And I remember on that Sunday night, as I'm sitting in church, that for, for that moment when the light of the gospel hit my heart, and folks, it knocked me for a loop that Sunday night, as I realized that this good old boy was nothing more than a filthy sinner before Almighty God. The light has to appear to us. It penetrates us. The Bible says God hath shined in our hearts. And I remember the night, the first time when he shined into my heart. And I believe that God has to shine in a man's heart for a man to be saved. We have to be given the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but also the knowledge that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And you know what? There's a lot of good people that are in this world today. A lot of good people. I came up Beaverdale Road yesterday, and there was a, a, a family that was broken down on the side of the road, or they're out in the middle of the road, and as I drove by, I thought, I wonder if they need help. And I looked at the lady, and I mean, the look on her face was, I like, she needs help. And so I, I pulled in and, and waited a little bit. Somebody brought him gas that had stopped before I did. And I remember that lady, just, just, she kept saying this, the other lady. She said, there's good people in the world. There's good people in the world. There's good people in the world. And you know what? There are good people in the world. But good people don't go to heaven, do they, church? Saved people go to heaven. People that have been born again go to heaven. They go to heaven. That was Saul's life beforehand. Secondly, look at his confrontation with the Lord because he's about to have a confrontation with the Lord. Beginning in verse 4, the Bible says this, And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he, Saul, said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. As you understand this, it's from this light that he heard a voice and he recognized this voice to be of much higher than any human being that he had ever stood be before. He used the word Lord there. He's going to use it twice. And trembling and terrified, he asked, he said, Lord, who are you? And folks, you've got to know that the next words that came out of Jesus' mouth had to be that dagger that stuck in his heart. It had to be, for he looked at him and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And again, for all we know, they never met. 
They never met. Maybe they did, but we never know of that in Scripture. So I'm going to think that Saul and Jesus never met. But he knew about him. But he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And I believe at that moment that Saul of Tarsus realized that every time he took a whip to a Christian's back, he was doing it to Jesus Christ. Every time he murdered a Christian, he was doing it to Jesus Christ. Every time he imprisoned a Christian, he was doing it to Jesus Christ. And it reminds me of this. Father, if you're a Christian, say amen. He knows when people do things to you and vengeance is his. Leave it in his hands, folks. Amen. Leave it in his hands. But understand something. Those folks that do evil to us, Understand something. First and foremost, Jesus Christ wants them to be saved. He wants them to be born again. That's why we're to pray for those that hurt us, those that persecute us. We're to lift them up to God in prayer because God loves all people. He loves all people. But he heard those words, I am Jesus whom thou persecutes. The text also includes, I didn't put it in here, that Jesus said it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. The prick was what they would use to prod an oxen as he was supposed to be plowing a field, and the, if the oxen would try to get out of the will of his master, they would take that, that cattle prod and they would prod him to, to get him back in. It's also a picture of a conscience. Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against my will, isn't it? It's hard for you to kick against your conscience. You know, I don't know, but something must have happened when he was standing there before Stephen watching him die. As Stephen lifted up his voice and said, do not lay this sin to their charge. Something must have been going on every time he would do something to a Christian and the way they acted, the way they behaved when they were being persecuted. And his conscience had been bothering him. It was tearing at him. And I believe our conscience bothers us when we're lost. As I sat there on that Sunday night, I'm going to tell you, I was squirming and moving. I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what the preacher was preaching that night, but I know what Jesus was saying that night. I know he was telling me that, Marty, you're not saved. You are not saved. And folks, it terrified me. It scared me to death. It did. And this confrontation that was going on with the Lord. And I'm going to be honest with you. Is that that moment that I am kicking against God's will? It's at that moment that I was kicking against my own conscience because I could feel God telling me, Marty, you're not saved. But I could hear Marty saying, but Marty, you have taught children's church. You have taught junior's church. You have never given your parents any problem. You're the good kid. I heard all these things coming back. I was kicking against the will of God. I was kicking against my own conscience. And I found out something that night. That the only person I was hurting was myself. I also found out that it's really foolish to resist him. Because he never quit. You know, this has been going on for months in my life. As a matter of fact, I had felt God working and pulling at my life. But I just kept shrugging it off, kept shrugging it off. I'm okay. I'm okay. I've done this and I'm doing that. I'm okay. But boy, that night it just, the light hit me hard. Same thing with Saul here. All of his resistance, all of his opposition, I believe it was gone at this moment. You know, there's a a lot of people are into this thing called MMA. I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not into that. But I just know that, I hear this phrase tapped out all the time. Tapped out, they tapped out. I want to tell you something on this road to Damascus at this point right here, Saul tapped out, folks. He tapped out. And I remember that Sunday night when, when I, I tapped out. I gave in. I gave up. And he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? If you went back and looked at verse 6, I'm not going to put it up. But he said, Lord, what will you have him to do? You know what? He's no more fighting, is he? He's not fighting anymore. Now he wants to be a follower. And I remember sitting there on Sunday night, and I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And I knew what I needed to do. I knew what the Lord was telling me to do. I knew I needed to get saved. I'm a huge Western fan. I love Westerns. I love the the old Westerns, the John Waynes, and and you can go all the way back to those. I love Westerns, and and I'll watch the same one 500 times. I just, I like Westerns. I was reading where one guy was talking about Westerns, and he said there's the OK Corral, and, you know, there's the gunfight at high noon. He said this was the, this little Squirmish that happened on the Damascus Road was the showdown at high noon. It was an epic confrontation between two great forces. There was Saul the terrorist out to hunt down Christians and kill them. And there was Jesus Christ the Savior 
full of grace. And it happened at high noon. And then he went on and he said this, but it was a terrible mismatch. Saul never had a chance. For grace and love came and confronted him, and in an instant, he was converted. He was converted. And it does say in verse 6, Jesus told him, here's what I want you to do. Get up, enter the city, and it'll be told you what you must do. Arise, go to the city, he said. You know what I love about this? I, I really got to thinking about this, and it never really dawned on me completely until I heard Brandon's testimony. And a little bit about what Abby said as well. God didn't tell him exactly right at that moment what he wanted him to do. He didn't, he didn't lay everything out. Well, buddy, here's what I want you to do. You're going to become one of the apostles. You're going to pen a lot of what we're going to call the New Testament. You're going to be a missionary to the Gentiles. He didn't hit him with all that. Can you imagine if he'd been hit with all that at one point? He just said, go to Damascus and it'll be told what you need to do. You know, he needed some time. He needed some time to, to let everything sink in. And I think that's what was going on with Brandon. Everything was, was sinking in. Wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall in Brandon's car when he's driving down the road trying to figure out, what is this? Who am I? Why am I crying? So, but that's what's happening. It's taking that time. You know, and eventually God's going to show Brandon and everyone else has been saying, this is exactly what I want you to do. But at this point, he needed time for prayer and meditation, for straightening out his mind, but also to get that assurance that you are now a believer in Jesus Christ. Which takes us to the third point, Saul's new life. And I love this. And by the way, if you have a story, you have an old life, you have exactly when you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, let me, let me share this with you on that. By the way, some of you are really messing me up. You're all out of your seats this morning. Every one of you are out of your seats, and I'm all messed up. So, all messed up. So, did, Barbara, I have never saw you in the balcony before. I didn't know you knew how to do steps. I'm just, uh, so, so, <laughs> did somebody take your seat? You gave it to somebody, so. <laughs> and I have no idea where I was going now, so. What, what did I say? I'm say again. Okay, I know that. I can read. I don't know what I was going to say. Let's just move on. Saul's new life, amen? Verse number eight, watch this. Watch this. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now I want you to jump down to verse 20 with me, if you would. Watch this. Now look up here real quick. After those three days, Ananias came. Paul received his sight. He spent some time with the believers there in Damascus. And you jump down to verse 20, and it says this. And immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name? and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Folks, I love verse 20. He finally made it to the synagogue he was going to. Remember the first verse, he was headed to the synagogue in Damascus to arrest Christians? Hey, can you imagine that day? And whoever was over that synagogue at Damascus when Saul came walking in there, I mean, folks, this is one of the Sanhedrin now. This is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He is, came here with important papers from the high priest. They gave him the seat of honor. He was going to stand up and he was speaking. He would probably read from some Old Testament prophecy somewhere in the Old Testament. He would say a few words. And then he would say, I have papers here from the high priest. But can you imagine what happened? Or we kind of read a little bit about what happened when he stood up and the Bible says that he began to proclaim in the same synagogue he went to arrest Christians that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Did he have a life change, folks? He had a life change, didn't he? He had a life change. And his life change was so much that those that were hearing him, this, it says they, they were amazed. What's wrong with this guy? This isn't the guy that we had heard about. This isn't the, what's happened to him. Why is he so different? 
I love what R.C. Sproul says. He says, just minutes before his conversion, all that Paul could think of was what he could do to Christ. But immediately after, all he could think of is, what can I do for Christ? Which reveals the essence of true conversion. That my life has changed. You know, everybody in Damascus may not have known what was going on. But everybody in Damascus knew that something clearly had happened to this man. And if anyone ever comes to real, redemptive, saving contact with the risen Christ, you will not walk away the same. He will change you in a very obvious way. You know, I was that good kid, and sometimes you struggle when you're raised in church all your life. You know, did anything happen in my life? Oh, it did. You see, I was a good kid, but I ran around with a bunch of folks that they did some things they probably shouldn't, and they loved to use language that I never used. I wouldn't use the language, but it never bothered me. It never bothered me. You know, I would teach lessons and read my Bible, but I didn't understand a lot of what I was reading. As a matter of fact, I didn't understand hardly any of it. I've told you this before. The, the one thing that always got me was the, the Lord's, you know, the, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, before I was a Christian, every time I looked at that, and I thought, I just don't understand that. I don't understand that verse. The Lord is my shepherd, but, but he doesn't want him as his shepherd. That, that's all I could see. But you know, after I got saved and started reading the Bible, oh my goodness, it started making so much sense to me. And all of a sudden, when I got to Psalm 23 and I read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, oh, oh. Because he's my shepherd, I'm not going to lack any good thing in my life as long as I'm following my shepherd. I remember being with a bunch of friends. One in particular, man, he had a foul mouth. He just had a foul mouth. And I remember I, I, he said something, and I, I called him by name, and I said, man, can we just not talk like that? And I remember everybody kind of stopped, and everybody turned around and looked at me. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to turn around and look and see who said that too. And it shook me to my core, because I'd never said anything like that before in my life. And I waited about 20 minutes, and I told him I needed to go, and I left. And I remember sitting, trying to figure out what is happening to me. You know what's happening to me? Jesus Christ was changing me on the inside, and it was making its way to the outside. It was. My life forever changed on that day. I think people still fight against the Lord each and every Sunday. I think many people fight the way that I did. But I'm this and I'm that and I've done all this. But you know, when I really stopped and think back on that, I knew in my heart I didn't have a relationship with God. I was just doing things. I was doing things, but I wasn't with Him. He wasn't my Lord. I said He was, but I was just doing things. I believe a lot of people fight that every week. I believe they kick against their own conscience and they kick against God's will. Some folks feel like their sin's so deep that God can't forgive them. He forgave this man. I think some folks honestly believe that their sin is so much fun they don't want to give it up just yet. I don't want to give it up. I'm enjoying it too much. I think some people are just afraid of what is everybody going to think. And I remember that Sunday evening, I was very afraid of that. I thought, what will my parents think? I've been baptized. Again, I was teaching you know, when it came down to it, I just said, you know what? No. And I got up out of my seat, and I walked from the far right side. And halfway up through that, I couldn't, and listen, everybody's story is different. I'm not saying you have to be emotional, but I lost it coming down through there. I felt like everything was just taken off of me. And by the time I got to that front row, I couldn't spit out what I was trying to say. But Bill Brown, he knew what I was trying to say. He said, Marty, you need to get saved, don't you? And I remember telling him this. With snot and everything else. I said, I think I already did back there. And I did back there. The moment that I gave in. The moment that I gave in. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. 
I was the first part of that verse. I was the one that cried, Lord, Lord, I'm teaching, I'm doing this, I'm always here, so much more. And I realized that day that I was on that broad path. And I'm so thankful that Christ kept chasing me down. I'm so thankful that he came to me and reminded me or showed me the true essence of my sin, that I was guilty before him. I finally quit comparing myself to other people, and I compared myself to him. And that's when I found that I was a rotten sinner. You know what, folks? I'm still a sinner. But I have been saved by the marvelous grace of Jesus Christ. Never would have thought that my life would have went where it did. I'm glad that night that he didn't tell me everything that was going to take place because I'd probably ran for the hills. Probably would have. But it comes back to this. Which side of this are you on? Are you the one that just says, Lord, Lord? Or are you the one that's doing the will of the Father? Do you have your own story? Can you tell your story? You say, my story is not dramatic. My story is not dramatic. But it's my story of how Christ came into my life. There's somebody here this morning that needs to let go of religion and you need to get a relationship with Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus had the religion, but he didn't have the relationship. And God loved him so much he came to him. And I believe God has brought us back to this message just for somebody here this morning, possibly you, and possibly you've been in church all your life like I have. Possibly you're involved in your church like I was. But you're kicking against your conscience right now. You're fighting that. What do you do? You just surrender. Just surrender. Let him be the Lord of your life this morning. Would you bow with me all over the building? Just bow with me right there where you are, every head bowed.